My name is Kyle Reiner, and I'm a freshman in Dr. Himmelheim's German 235H class, and I'll be giving a presentation about the 1972 Munich Olympics and everything that occurred there from both the tragedy standpoint and the athletic achievements. And to start off, I'm going to focus on the anticipation behind the games. So, the excitement behind the Munich Summer Games was legitimate in that this was Germany's first chance to show themselves off on the world stage post-World War II, and they were set to host one of the better games in Olympic history, because before the first event even occurred, they uh, broke three world records in that they had the most number of athletes in an Olympic Games, the most number of events being competed in in an Olympic game history, and they had the most countries or Olympic committees present in any Olympic Games. So th these were set to be, in any way, shape, or form, the biggest games in Olympic history. Um, and sadly, before these games got to reach their potential, they were plagued with terrorism. So on September 5th at 4.30 a.m., a group of Palestinian terrorists in the Black September group um, forced entry into the Olympic Village. So they were actually seen breaking in by a group of athletes but they decided to disguise themselves as athletes and no one thought differently of it. So they were able to easily breach the Olympic Village and using stolen keys they uh, and the knowledge of the layout of the village, they were able to find the Israeli athletes living area and they broke in and upon entering they killed two members of the Israel Olympic team and actually graphically mutilated one and they took nine of them hostage. And the reasoning for doing this was that they wanted to negotiate a deal in which in exchange for these nine hostages, they wanted the return of 200 Palestinian terrorists, two German terrorists, as, as well as a getaway plane to flee the scene without harm. And they actually were able to, in their mind, secure a deal in that by the end of the night on September 5th, they had a plan set up with the Germans in that they were going to be transported to a local airbase and given that getaway plane in order to make the deal. But what they did not know was that there was an ambush waiting for them. But sadly, this ambush did not go well for multiple reasons. So first off, after World War II, Germans' military power was severely uh, diminished because of what they did in the involvement of World War I and World War II. So even though they would have been extremely prepared to handle a situation like this, the German military was not allowed to intervene with civilian issues, so this was left in the hands of the police who were far less prepared. Just showing off how unprepared they were, um, the police had snipers set up in uh, certain locations on the airbase, but they weren't nearly as well trained as the German snipers, and on top of that, they weren't even equipped with sniper rifles, so that aspect of the ambush was not going to succeed. Uh, they had armored vehicles to help with the raid, but those vehicles were actually stuck in traffic and were late to the airbase. And lastly, they failed to set up a radio communication, so they weren't able to communicate with each other during the uh, raid. And as a result of these uh, issues, it went horribly in that, while well, it was originally reported that the, the raid was successful and all nine terrorists were killed and the hostages were saved, uh, when it was all said and done, one German police officer and all nine uh, Israeli hostages were killed, while only five of the nine uh, terrorists were killed. So this basically could not have gone worse for anybody involved, and it was kind of a tragic day um, in what could have been easily, not easily, but what could have been more professionally dealt with by the German military, but they were limited because of, of course, post-World War II rules. So how this massacre happened. Um, referring back to the German military power allowed after World War II, um, they were not, once again, they were not allowed to intervene with civilian issues, so they were not allowed to aid in the security of the Munich Olympics and the Olympic Village in particular, so there was no military presence to scare off these terrorists. And on top of that, Germany was felt the pressure of this being their first chance to show themselves to the world after World War II. So the last thing they wanted was to give off a fearful vibe at the uh, games. They wanted it to be kind of a welcoming new Germany. Um, and as a result, they actually paid less than $2 million to 
secure the Olympics, and the the very limited security that they did have, they were unarmed so as not to seem threatening. So it could not have been easier to get past the security for the terrorists. Um, on top of that, um, one of the workers in the Olympic Village was actually later determined to be part of this group. So they were able to get information on where the Israel athletes were, as well as get stolen keys, making this job that much easier. So really, this was far too easy for the terrorists to pull off, just because of the lack of security that the Germans had. And while you can't really blame them, because they felt the pressure of not wanting to give off a militaristic impression as they had in past years, um, there was just not even remotely enough security at these games, which tragically led to this happening. Um, as for what the massacre did to the games, um, before they knew what to do, for the first time in Olympic history, these did suspend the Olympic Games. So for 24 hours, the games were put on hold, and they, the uh, important people in charge discussed what they would do. So while everyone knew this was a tragic event, it was determined that they didn't want to let the violence overshadow all that these athletes have done, and they also didn't want to let the terrorists win. So rather than canceling the games, they decided that they would hold a memorial service for these athletes, and then they would continue with the games. And a famous quote actually came from this service in which it was emphatically proclaimed that the games must go on. And from there, they did just that. They continued to show world-class athletes off to the world, and not forgetting what happened, but showing that the world was strong enough to rally behind each other and not let fear uh, cancel what these people had worked for. So moving on to the actual athletic achievements, these games, once again, were very successful from an athletic standpoint, and they had some very famous to this day athletic events, one of them being the USSR versus the USA gold medal basketball game. Uh, before the 1980 Miracle on Ice, in which the United States dethroned the dominant Soviet hockey team, uh, there was actually kind of an opposite outcome in the 1972 Summer Olympics. So going into the gold medal game, the United States had never lost a basketball game on the men's side of Olympic competition. And with just seconds left, it seemed like this game would be no different. Uh, the United States was up 50 to 49, and it seemed as though the game was over. But for almost an inexcusable and unexplainable reason, the referee decided to put three more seconds on the clock. And with these additional three seconds, the Soviets scored a game-winning basket to win 51 to 50. And the United States was absolutely appalled by this. And their decision was that after the game, they refused to accept their silver medal and did not go to the medal ceremony and went on to actually appeal the outcome of the game. And somehow, even though the referee and the timekeeper both agreed at this appeal that the time should not have been added onto the clock, the Olympic Committee decided to deny the appeal and said that the gold medal would stand for the Soviet Union. And that was the first time in Olympic history that the men's basketball team was defeated in competition. And the other famous event to this day was actually in the swimming pool in which before Michael Phelps, the famous United States swimmer, was Mark Spitz. So the 1972 Olympics were not Mark Spitz's first Olympics. He actually swam in the 1968 Olympics and made an extremely bold prediction in which before the game started, he said he would walk away with six gold medals. And at these, event, at these games, he only won two gold medals. While that's not a poor performance, after saying he would win six, only walking away with a third of the medals he predicted most certainly left a bitter taste in his mouth. And he clearly trained with a chip on his shoulder because in 1972, he did the unthinkable. He competed in seven events and won seven gold medals in each event. Every event he swam in, he got the gold medal, and he broke the record for gold medals in an event, which stood until 2008 when Michael Phelps himself won eight. So this was one of the most dominant individual performances in Olympic history, and it should not go unnoticed just because of what happened with the terrorist attack on September 5th of those games. So while there, I don't physically have an audience to take questions from, I've put my email on the PowerPoint. If anyone has any questions or would like to discuss anything I said or if they have any opinions, I'd be happy to answer any emails that anyone may have. Um, again, Rena KT 2023 at myunion.edu is my contact, and I'd once again be happy to field any questions. So 
just in a quick summary of all of this, these games were extremely highly anticipated and everyone was looking forward to them and they had potential to be one of the greatest athletic events in history, but sadly they'll always be remembered as a notorious event because of what the hate-filled crime by the Palestinian terrorists uh, took that day. Um, so obviously any athletic achievement is going to be overshadowed, but while they are overshadowed, they shouldn't be overlooked because these world-class athletes trained for four years to prepare for these moments, and one day of hate shouldn't overshadow completely four years. So it's important to look back on the impressive individual and team accomplishments that happened at these games. Otherwise, the hate wins. So I think that it was important to discuss the United States versus USSR basketball game, Mark Spitz's individual performances, and there are actually more famous events that occurred too, but just none of them rivaled those two events. So once again, if anyone has any questions, that's my email. Here are my sources if anybody would like to read up more on the games, and here are my photo sources as well. Thank you very much.